All right, thanks. Um, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, to both. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, My screen loaded. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so as many people on this call are probably aware, um, the UWFPS campaign was a combined uh, aircraft and ground-based campaign that took place in early 2017. And its goal was uh, really to understand um, PM 2.5 pollution episodes. And as we were planning the NOAA Twin Otter aircraft uh, flight plans, which is shown here in uh, black line, um, a number of local air quality investigators told us that it might be worthwhile to um, just pop over to the west side of the lake um, because there's some interesting industrial activity over there. So on our very first flight, um, we did a pass by uh, one of these industrial point sources and we saw some very interesting chemistry. So um, you can see here uh, we saw quite a large amount of halogens, so Cl2, chlorine, um, bromine, Br2, and BrCl, and simultaneously saw this sort of massive um, depletion in ozone. So sometimes ozone titration can occur if there's a large NOx source nearby, um, but as you can see, uh, that wasn't the case here. So this was really being caused by um, this halogen chemistry. This was so interesting to us that we kept going back. Um, we did a total of 10 flights where we circled um, this area, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So before I get into what we saw, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about um, the chemistry behind ozone uh, depletion from halogens. Um, so this is a well-known phenomenon in mostly in polar regions. Um, so up there, uh, halogens are um, emitted from sea salt um, and found on, on these ice caps. Um, and they are uh, converted into the dihalogen species, which is then photolyzed uh, to form the halogen radical, which then is very reactive. So it sort of immediately grabs an oxygen from um, any available ozone molecule, thereby destroying the ozone to make this halogen oxide. The halogen oxide can do a couple of different things, particularly in this very pristine atmosphere. Um, but one of them is uh, recycling the dihalogen or the halogen radical. In this way, um, this is a catalytic cycle. So very small amounts of bromine, typically, uh, not bromine, um, all halogens, uh, typically on the order of a, a few PPT um, can really uh, have a outsized effect on ozone. So this is a well-known phenomenon. It's sometimes called the bromine explosion. It happens every spring. Um, but uh, in the Great Salt Lake, this is, uh, this is a sort of a rarely seen phenomenon as far as I know, down here in the mid-latitudes. Um, I would, and because of that, we're sort of filling the blanks. Um, it's likely that this chemistry is all uh, pretty much the same, um, but in some ways also very different. So we have much larger concentrations of these dihalogens, but then we also have, because it's this continental uh, uh, environment, um, other possible reactions for these um, reactive radicals. So like they could uh, react with VOCs to form other compounds. So this um, is all very interesting. We want to know more about it. So the questions that we would like to know um, from the study are listed here. Number one, what is the extent of the influence of these halogen emissions from that point source? Uh, two, what is, can we quantify the emission flux from this particular source? And then three, what happens um, downwind? What is the effect of these emissions? So starting with this first question, um, the halogens were uh, observed on the NOAA Twin Otter aircraft um, using the University of Washington's iodide chemical ionization mass spectrometer, or the I minus SIMS, uh, pictured here. It's an in instrument that can measure all of these species, including a lot of halogenated species. Um, it also can measure some species that uh, it's not calibrated for, so it can get a, a relative signal, but not an absolute signal. Um, because this instrument, because these species are tend to be pretty reactive, um, the SIMS has a number of instrument interferences and inlet effects that we have to account for. Um, they've largely been accounted for, but it's, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, so in the end, uh, we were able to pull out about 185 distinct instances where the plane flew through um, some air mass that had an elevated amount of, of halogen. And it happened on nearly all of the, the 23 flights. 
Um, but the, the question that I think is, is good to ask right away is, are we sure that this industrial area is the source? There's other possible sources of halogens, including the Great Salt Lake. Um, so I'm just going to show you this video, which um, lays it out pretty clearly. So this was a video taken by um, our one of the grad students out the window of the plane as we circled this industrial area. So you can see that as we came in, there's this plume right here. And then right here, we flew right into it. And there was this large um, uh, halogen peak. So in this case, you know, it's pretty obvious that uh, this area is a source of halogens. It's not necessarily the only one, but these large halogen peaks that we're going to talk about um, are certainly coming from this area. So another tool um, in our arsenal uh, for uh, source attribution is back trajectories. So we use the stilt model, um, which is shown here, and it's basically a way of determining where any particular air mass um, is likely to have been um, previously. So it's, it's a way of looking at um, upwind influences. So John Lynn at the University of Utah very helpfully ran hundreds of these uh, trajectory models um, for the campaign including once every one or two minutes um, for the Twin Otter observations, which was really valuable to us because it allows us to start tracing um, the observations back to sources. So for example, um, this is an example flight track on January 26. This is the flight direction and it's colored by bromine. So you can see that right around here, we flew into this uh, bromine spike. The gray lines show um, a, a subset of those 200 particles that were part of this modeling effort that are um, followed back in time for 24 hours. So you can see where each of those um, sort of imaginary particles came from so that they all together form this sort of um, cone of probability from where that air came from. And you can see that that, that helps us uh, trace this back to this industrial area, which is shown in the blue marker. Um, similarly, this is an example where we didn't actually get that close to the industrial source, which is shown here, but nevertheless saw um, a couple tens to 100 um, PPT of bromine, which is still fairly high, and using the stilt model with this cone of uh, probability shown in the gray lines, um, we can sort of reasonably assume that this um, was probably influenced by that industrial source. So in the end, um, like I was saying before, we uh, singled out about 185 different instances where um, it is likely due to the halogens, due to ozone depletion, and due to the stilt modeling. We think that um, that air mass may have been influenced by this industrial source. Um, I've colored, I've, I've plotted it here twice, um, once colored by chlorine and once colored by ozone. And so in the left-hand plot, you can see that um, while most of the high chlorine peaks are centered right around um, this area. And I should note that I, I cut off the, the color scale. So this is actually 10 and above. So the, the highest peaks are actually about 600 um, ppb. But I, I cut this off just so you could see the, the variation. Um, so most of um, this chlorine is occurring over on the west side of the lake. But if you look over here in these um, populated areas, there are some instances where you're getting um, higher than baseline uh, chlorine, so in the sort of tens to hundreds of PPT. Um, and what's interesting to me about this is if you look at the ozone, um, again, we're looking for ozone titration, so the color scale is kind of backwards here. Um, yellow indicates no ozone titration, whereas the darker colors um, indicate um, some titration. So you can see over in these populated areas, while they tend to be sort of um, yellowish to orange, which is 30, 35, there are some instances where we're seeing, you know, 30, 20, even 10 PB, PBB of ozone, which is telling us that although the chlorine and the other halogens may have reacted away already, um, the evidence of that influence in terms of ozone um, depletion um, is still there. So it's possible that this is, um, uh, we're seeing effects of these emissions um, further downwind um, than maybe we thought initially. Okay, um, so item number two is, can we quantify the flux? And so for this, we look to the nighttime um, observations because at night, all of this chemistry stops. And in fact, we don't see any ozone depletions at night. Uh, all we see is emission of this dihalogen um, species. So you can kind of visualize the plume like this, where at night, the only thing that's happening is that these uh, species are getting emitted and just diluting a little bit as they go downwind. So if we fly downwind of this plume and try to intersect it you know, perpendicularly, we can integrate across that plume 
um, and then weight it by the, the wind speed to get an emission flux or a um, amount, a mass of halogen emitted per second. And if we do that at uh, numerous times downwind, um, that is a reasonable um, estimate of the total amount of each of these species that's coming out of this smokestack. So there were three night flights where we were able to do this, a total of 21 plumes. So we just took the average of those. And that's what's shown here um, in this uh, column. And then we were also able to compare this to uh, what the port source has reported um, in terms of its emissions. So they reported that in 2015, they emitted uh, close to 1,900 tons per year of chlorine, uh, 1,500 tons per year of uh, HCl. If you convert that to grams per second, you get um, 54 and 43 grams per second respectively, which is actually in pretty good agreement with what we uh, measured, although I should note that we actually had a, a quite a big range, um, and that has to do with just sort of the uncertainties of doing the measurement that way. Um, it's not a perfect um, technique. Um, so what's interesting here is that while the chlorine emissions um, line up pretty well, bromine, um, BR2, and BRCl are not reported because as far as I know, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, they are not listed on the list of hazardous um, air pollutants. And so therefore they don't need to be reported. Again, I'm happy to be corrected um, on that if if that's not true or if I don't understand the full situation, but they, they don't seem to be, I have no um, record of them being reported. But if we were to scale these emissions just by the ratio um, to chlorine, that would be equivalent to about 370 tons per year of bromine, um, close to 1,000 tons per year of um, BRCL, which is um, fairly significant. Although I, I should note that these are still not um, cite these at the moment because we're still um, working them out. Okay, so in my last couple of minutes, um, I'll just talk about what happens downwind. Why do why should we care um, that all of these uh, uh, halogens are being emitted. So for this, we use a tool called zero-dimensional box modeling. You can visualize it like this, where you put in a certain concentration of your chemical species. Um, we're using a model called foam here, um, and it just propagates the chemistry over time. And you can also introduce emissions. You can introduce uh, photochemistry via solar flux and allow for dilution uh, losses by, um, by a dilution or deposition. So the pros here are that it's a really simple easy to run model. Um, it's because it's so simple, you can really get into the explicit chemical detail. And so it's a nice way to understand the chemistry that's happening in plumes. Of course, there's some downsides, of course, there's, um, you know, it doesn't include plume dynamics. So it's um, by necessity, a very simplified model. Um, so I have to admit, I was hoping to have finished um, this modeling effort by now. Um, but I didn't quite finish it. So rather than show a sort of half-baked um, model of, of our observations, what I'm going to show instead is just a theoretical model to, get to, to demonstrate the effect of bromine chemistry um, in the system. So what I've done here is I've taken um, sort of a typical uh, concentration um, at one of these um, concentrated plumes. Um, for these halogens, along with a, a few background VOCs um, and some just sort of typical pressure, temperature, relative humidity, uh, what would happen um, in the midday, and uh, just let this run for an hour just to demonstrate what might be happening um, when these halogens are emitted. And I've done this model in two ways, once with just the chlorine and uh, then again with the bromine chemistry. And what I'm showing is the difference between those two, just to emphasize what the effect is of including bromine chemistry. So um, over here, you can see that this is, uh, the model time is on the x-axis. These species um, both photolyze away and also are diluted away. So you, um, over the, the course of the model, um, they just uh, go to zero. And then down here, you can see what's happening to the ozone. And as, um, Okay, um, as described, um, you see this uh, almost complete ozone titration. And what I've uh, shown here in the dark, the, the solid and the dashed lines is the solid is with all of the chemistry and the, uh, the dashed line is just with the chlorine, meaning no bromine. So the effect here, if you look at the difference between those two is that including bromine chemistry, even in the very small amounts that we did, um, almost doubles the speed of this ozone um, depletion. And then 
furthermore, um, what I just pulled out of this model was what is the effect on some of these oxidants, because that is something that we'll care about uh, downwind. So I won't go through all of this just to point out that there's some uh, pretty significant differences in these oxidants um, that are known to be uh, be very effective in, in changing the chemistry downwind. So RO2, HO2, OH, and formaldehyde, as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference when you start including bromine chemistry. So um, I'm almost out of time, so I'll, I'll just wrap up and say that uh, what we, this is still very much a work in progress, but what we uh, think that we're finding is that um, these halogens emissions are possibly sort of widespread. Um, we think we have some tentative numbers for emission fluxes, but again, this is preliminary. Um, we'll get final answers soon. And uh, this is still pending further modeling, but obviously some very interesting chemistry is happening. So I'll just um, stop here by thanking the people involved, particularly those um, in green. Uh, this is um, our funding and I'd be happy to um, take any questions. I'll leave that slide up. Thanks so much. That's fascinating work. Um, who has questions? Actually, I, I do. So um, uh, are you thinking at all about the effect that some of these halogens have on particulate matter formation? Because we've certainly seen during episodes when we've got L um, ammonium chloride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was definitely one of the questions behind UWFPS was uh, are uh, chlorine containing aerosol um, a significant contributor, and I know that you've done some work on that yourself. Um, and I think that what we found was that it wasn't a huge contributor. So it, so I think that there's two ways you can think about this. You can think about halogen containing aerosol as one aspect, but we can also think like, like this shows, um, halogens are just really effective oxidizers um, and they can kickstart a lot of this chemistry. So I think there's two kind of avenues to go down um, and we'll probably go uh, look at both. But yeah, I don't, I don't quite have an answer on that yet. Okay, great, thanks. I guess we better not shut that plant down or we'll have more trouble on the Wasatch Front meeting the ozone. <laughs> yeah, that is, um, it really highlights how complicated ozone is. Um, I, I think that'll be something we we look at because you know ozone is not great for us. But then, if you destroy ozone, what are you forming? I think is the real question. Right. Uh, who else has questions? I'm interested about one of the questions in the chat, and that is, uh, uh, while this is a little bit out of your wheelhouse, um, what are the health effects of bromine directly? Yeah, um, very interesting. And again, I, I don't think that I can answer that because that's way out of my wheelhouse. Um, and I'd love to hear if anybody happens to know. It looks like Judy answered in the chat. Um, I don't know if Judy is willing to yeah. put on her mic, but there is a very interesting um, tidbit yeah. in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah. I uh, sorry. I can I can help provide some backup. Yeah, I I just did a quick search, and like most of the the stuff that I've seen on bromine is related to exposure in occupational settings, and also through like environmental exposure via flame retardants. And um, so those are <laughs> organic compounds with bromine. Um, conveniently bounded to, to like, you know, an organic backbone. Um, really bad for your thyroid, by the way. Um, but I, I don't, I personally haven't seen a lot on airborne roaming air pollution and health effects in the general public. I would imagine that mm -hmm. there's probably a lot more done in occupational settings though. Um, so if you are, if you guys are interested, so EPA has um, like, like entire like summaries about like reviews of the toxicity and environmental behavior of bromine and methyl bromine in particular. And then mm -hmm. um, ATSDR also may have a toxicologic profile on the on bromine um, in environmental setting. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I should say that it's it's not that the EPA doesn't monitor anything to do with bromine. Um, there's a lot of uh, like you said, organic bromine species that are definitely considered toxic and are monitored by the EPA. I was when I said that 
I, I think that they don't look at the dihalogen bromine. That was that was all I was going to say. So yeah, so there's Correct. there's definitely a lot of work out there on on the health effects of bromine containing compounds, um, and that's something that we'll definitely want to look at. Great, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Carrie, uh, and for everyone who has presented so far today. Um, before